job. Hey, let's choose the Lord, huh? And uh, that's the greatest choice we'll ever make. People will let you down. Uh, I'll let you down. We'll let each other down. We'll let ourselves down. But God will never let us down. I hope you have your Bibles now. We're going to be in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. The message tonight, uh, today, uh, is entitled Finding Purpose. Finding Purpose in the Pause. Finding Purpose in the Pause. Uh, in verse number 1, uh, of our uh, scripture passage here, 1 Kings 17, verse 1, Elijah, uh, the Tishbite, uh, who uh, uh, was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, all right, uh, we're answerable to no one primarily other than God. And uh, we thank God for the leadership and the authorities and governments and principalities and all the, the uh, structure that God's uh, set up according to His Word. Uh, but we stand before uh, one, an audience of one uh, is who we represent, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, before whom I stand, there shall uh, not be dew nor rain these, th these years, uh, but according to my word. And so uh, Elijah comes and, and uh, approaches Ahab, and, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, there is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Uh, now uh, he went and did according to the word of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and the bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So God's providing for him. And it came to pass, verse number 7, after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land, and the Lord, word of the Lord came unto him, saying, and then the, the Lord showed up again. Uh, Father, bless our time together. Lord, still our hearts and minds. Take away all the distractions that uh, Satan would love to bring into our, our thoughts right now and to help us to focus upon you uh, during this hour. Lord, thank you for the people of God and for the faithfulness in tuning in uh, this morning. And uh, knit our hearts together, though we're distant today, Holy Spirit of God, knit our hearts together, please. Uh, we need that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can uh, go ahead and be seated, I was going to say, all right. Elijah comes to King Ahab uh, in our story and makes a bold proclamation uh, concerning God's judgment uh, on the land. Uh, and it's about to come. Uh, it's going to be a judgment, we'll find out, of three and a half years. Um, of no dew. Can you imagine that? No moisture at all, no rain at all for over three years, three and a half years. It would seem, after pronouncing this judgment and making this proclamation uh, that Elijah had to make, that God would have taken Elijah out of this uh, situation, out of this place that there would be the famine, and uh, remove him uh, from this uh, part of the judgment. But this isn't what happened. Uh, we don't see Elijah being uh, uh, miraculously transported away from this place where God's judgment was going to come upon Ahab and the people of God. Look at verse number 3 of our text. It says, Elijah, that great man of God, what did he have to do? He had to hide himself. And so God says, here's what I want you to do. Uh, get thee hence and turn the eastward. And what? Hide thyself. Hey, uh, Elijah had to get sheltered in. And he had to hide himself. Uh, uh, from um, uh, the problems were still going to come, but he was sheltered in at this time. Uh, no preaching engagements, uh, no outward appointments that he had to do, uh, no opportunities to do uh, miracle working uh, power of God to work through him. He was shut in like we are, sheltered in uh, in this hiding place. And so uh, we see that this was a very secluded place. The Bible goes on and tells us that the ravens were going to feed him and that he would drink from a, a brook there uh, by the name of Cherith. And, uh, and so this seemed like a, a good setup here, uh, but things get worse. Things get worse. Uh, we see according to the verse in verse number 7, after a while it came to pass, after a while something happened. What happened? 
that brook began to get shallower and shallower and less and less water until finally it wasn't even muddy anymore. The brook dried up. The ground uh, uh, where the water would normally have flowed uh, was gone. It was dried up. And God shows up uh, at this time in, in um, Elijah's life and uh, tells him it's time to, to move forward. A couple of things I want you to, to recognize here. Number one, obeying God doesn't mean that the brook won't dry up. Uh, obeying God doesn't mean that the brook won't dry up. Uh, did, it, did it mean Elijah had sinned in his life? No, it didn't. Did it mean that uh, Elijah was out of God's will when the brook dried up? No. Uh, did it mean that God was displeased with Elijah in some area of his life? No, no, not at all. Uh, it just meant that God had a, a plan for Elijah's life, and God wanted Elijah to go to another place. God had another a plan, another a destination that, that um, uh, God wanted Elijah to be moving towards. And sometimes it's in the droughts of our lives. Sometimes it's in the famines of our lives that God says, now's the time. I want you to move from where you are now spiritually. And I want you to move to a, a, a higher ground of a spiritual maturity and a higher ground of walk with God and, and a more mature uh, focus and faith in God. It's a time to move to a better place, a, a higher place a more spiritual place that God can use us in a greater way. And, and so the, uh, the calamities uh, that befall nations also visit the people of God. And uh, like it did uh, with Elijah who dwells there, the tares and the wheats will have to grow uh, together. And if the tares are withered for lack of moisture, then the wheat also are going to suffer that lack of moisture or of the same cause. God does not exempt His people from their share of national calamity and national hardship and national uh, sorrow that comes their way. But although allows his people and permits his people to suffer in the midst of a general uh, a judgment of a nation made he never forgets them he never forsakes them he never abandons them we see in psalm 34 verse 19 many are the afflictions of the righteous oh here it is though but the lord but the lord that what's he do he delivers them from them all. You see, we've got God on our side. We've got the Lord on our side. And uh, we live in a world where uh, there's going to be hardships and trials and, and difficulties and problems and calamities. But the Lord, but the Lord, He's on our side and He'll deliver us. He'll deliver us from all those troubles and all those hardships and all those problems that come in uh, to our lives. Praise God. And so now God instructs the prophet. Elijah to walk 100 miles north uh, to a town, to a place called Zarephath. And it was there in that place that God would instruct a little widow and her son uh, to be able to provide for him there. And uh, we see that in, in 1 Kings uh, 17 down verses 8, 8 through 14. For the sake of time, we won't look at that, but I will encourage you to look at that a little bit later. So the first truth I want you to see in the, the introductory comments here is, number one, obeying God does not mean, does not mean that the brook won't dry up at times in our lives. But also, number two, when Cherith dries up or when the brook dries up, God will always prepare a Zarephath. Can you see him? The widow and her son had food to eat. Uh, they didn't die of starvation. Elijah had a room and a bed to sleep in. Elijah had now a, prof, a people that he could talk to. I'm sure after some time, I can hear the old prophet saying to the woman, you know, the best thing that ever happened to me was when that brook chair had dried up. I would have never come to this place and have gotten to know you and your son and the fellowship and the time we've been able to grow and to share our faith together. This has been a great thing. You see, you'll look back of this time, this uh, COVID-19, and we'll look back as a people and say, you know what? Boy, I'll tell you what, that was a difficult time. That was a trying time. That was an uncertain time. But we're going to look back and say, you know what? That was the best thing that ever could happen to us. That was the best thing that God ever allowed us to go through because today we're much better than we ever could have been had the brook Cherith not dried up because God was taking us to a different place, a higher place, a better place to grow in our walk with God. Oh, I I can see it uh, where he looks to there and says, you know what? It's the best thing that ever happened when the brook dried up. My friend, God's going to do the same for you and I. God is bigger than a dry brook. God is bigger than a lost job. God is bigger than a deep disappointment, a wounded spirit, a broken heart. God is bigger than that. He 
he's greater than that. Oh, he's a wonderful God that we serve. You see, God knows about a place called Zarephath. And if you follow God, he'll get you there. It's a higher place. It's a better place. It's a place that will take you closer to God. You'll experience some great things from God. But you're going to have to have some brooks that are going to dry up to say it's now time to move to a higher level of spirituality. You see, Elijah had his part in the natural calamity that came upon the judgment of the famine in the land. But God remembered his servant. Now, take your Bibles and let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. Oh, I like it. I like it. 1 Kings chapter 18. God never forgets his own. And he's not forgetting us uh, as we go through these times. 1 Kings chapter 18, look what it says in verse number 1. And it came to pass after many days, and it always will come to pass. It always does come to pass. And, and it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. Now we know from James, it was a total of three and a half years, but well over three years it says, go show thyself unto Ahab. And what you say? I'm going to now, I'm going to send rain upon the earth. You see, sometimes God allows his people to go through a holding pattern uh, and uh, where you're just in a, a place of a pause in your life. Uh, what are you to do uh, when you're in that pause time in your life? What's the purpose of that pause? There he was for three and a half years after he met with the king Ahab the first time for the next three and a half years of his life. Elijah is placed on pause. His life is placed on hold. There's a pause in his life. There's a pause in our life right now. And uh, we're in this hiding place. We're in this sheltered end time. What are we to do during this pause? Uh, what's God trying to accomplish? What's the purpose of the pause that we're going through in our lives? What are we to do? What well, we see in Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We see in Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. On several occasions, the psalmist cries out, O oh Lord, how long? Oh, Lord, how long? We see it in Psalm 6, 3, and Psalm 13, 1, and Psalm 35, 17, and Psalm 79, 5, Psalm 84, and Psalm 89, 46, and Psalm 90, verse 13, and other passages where the day, Psalm cries out, Oh, Lord, how long? How long? And maybe you today, like the rest of us, are saying, God, how long is this sheltered in time? How long is this pause? What's the purpose that God's trying to accomplish in this pause in our lives. You see, it's not, uh, it's not very easy uh, to go through something when you don't know how long you're going to have to wait to go through it. Uh, it is not easier to make it through something, but if we just knew how long that it was going to last, doesn't that make it a little bit easier? Uh, you just knew how long until uh, you were going to be able to be reunited with a loved one. Or you knew if it was going to be how long uh, that uh, you were going to find uh, healing. Or how long uh, this upcoming surgery uh, was going to take to get back to normal. Or how long it would take until a loved one got right with God. Or the prodigal came home. Or a loved one got saved. If I just knew how long, it would certainly make it so much easier. God knows how long it will take. But we trust in the God who knows that even though we don't know how long. And so the Bible is full of examples of people that were taught patience through the waiting time, the pause times in, your, in their lives. Uh, Noah got on the ark, and God shut the door. And uh, what a time uh, that must have been. He anticipated, boy, the rains are going to come. The flood's going to come. The door was shut. And there he and his family sit in that ark. Seven days had passed, and the rain hadn't come. A pause, a holding pattern. Finally, the rain stopped, and Noah had to stay in the ark for one more year before he could get off the ark. Another holding pattern, another time of pause, of waiting. Joseph, as a 17-year-old boy, had dreams he would one day rule the kingdom, and that uh, one day his brothers would one day bow down uh, to him. But it didn't happen for another 13 years, uh, 13 years of pause, 13 years of waiting, 13 years of sheltered in, 13 years uh, of waiting on God, a holding pattern that he was waiting for when God was going to do what God uh, was uh, purposed to do. Moses, Moses knew that he would uh, lead Israel out of Egypt one day. 
but he finds himself on the backside of a desert for 40 years tending sheep. 40 years in a holding pattern. 40 years waiting. What are you to do, preacher, during this waiting time? What's the purpose of the pause of this waiting time that we have to be placed in uh, in our lives? There is a purpose, Hebrews 12, 1. And let us run with what? Patience, the race that is set before us. Romans 12, 12 says patient in tribulation. James 1, 3 says knowing this, that the trying of your patience, trying of your faith worketh patience. You said, preacher, what, what is patience? Well, I always tell folks, there's two things I don't want to pray for. I don't want to pray for humility. God always seems to answer that pretty quick, huh? Amen. And, uh, and I don't want to pray for uh, uh, patience because it seems like God answers that one real quick. Uh, and so the pause uh, is God's wanting to teach us something here, uh, teach us uh, something about patient. What is it to be patient? Well, most of us would define patience as this, a delay in getting what I want. A delay in getting what I want uh, is what allows us uh, to become impatient. As Margaret Thatcher uh, so famously remarked, and she said, she said, I'm ext uh, extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily patient provided I get my own way in the end. And that sort of probably summarizes the way most of uh, this world defines patient. But let me give you a Bible definition of what patience is. Take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We'll come back to our text scripture here in just a moment. But uh, let me give you a Bible definition of what, uh, what patience is. It's not just a delay of getting what I want. That's not what patience is. Here's what it is. Let me read the verse for you, and then I'll give you a definition for it. Let me get, tell you what the definition is, and then I'll give you the verse. Here's what patience is. Write it down. Write it down. Got your notebooks out there. I've encouraged you to do a, a COVID-19 spiritual notebook. Sermons you've heard during this, this uh, uh, pause time in your life. Uh, personal, uh, individual devotions you're having with God. How God's speaking to your heart uh, with your own personal COVID-19 uh, journal. But uh, here's what it is. Here's the definition of patience. The time between. Listen now. Write it down. The time between. When you do right and you get rewarded for the doing of right. Let me give it to you again. Patience is the time between the doing of right and then when you get rewarded for the doing of right. Here's a Bible verse uh, that I want you to look at. And uh, look in Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verse number um, 36. It says, for you have need of what? Patience. That's a need we all have, amen? We don't like to recognize that need, but that's what it is. We have a need of patience. That what? After you've done the will of God. What's that? You've done right. You're trying to serve God. You're trying to live right. Trying to be a good testimony. Trying to be a good role model. Trying to be a good example. You're just doing right. So you've done right. So it says you have need of patience. That after the doing of right, what happens? You might receive the promise. That's a reward that you receive after having done the right. And so that's what Bible patience is. It's not waiting for getting what you want. Because what you want may not be what you need. What you want may not be what God has for you. What you want may not be according to God's perfect will for your life. But patience is doing the right thing and trusting God in His timing, waiting until He rewards the rightness of that decision or the results of the doing of that right decision. Uh, and so uh, as we look at this, uh, the measure of one's spirituality, the measure of one's spirituality is measured by how long you're able to wait upon the Lord to be rewarded. How long are you able to keep waiting on God, keep trusting in God, keep depending upon God until God can reward you and so God can bless you and God can give the desires of your heart and God can give you exceeding abundantly? How long are you able to wait on God? You see, the spiritual maturity of God's people must be willing to wait and wait and wait until God chooses to reward us based upon the timing that God says is the right timing. I am spiritually immature when I become impatient to be rewarded by what I believe I deserve now because I did right today. I expect to be rewarded now. But God says, no, I'll reward you in time. But there's a purpose for the pause. There's a reason 
for this waiting time uh, in our lives. Um, someone once said, you're only young once, but you can be immature indefinitely. You're only, you're only young once. But you and I can be immature indefinitely. You see, immaturity needs immediate results. Immaturity needs immediate reward. Immaturity needs immediate answers. Immaturity uh, needs an immediate response. But spiritual maturity is able to wait on God. Let me give you an example. Uh, how about it? Uh, you're going on a family vacation. All right, and uh, you got the you got all packed up, and you get all the kids gathered together, and uh, everybody gets crammed in the car, and everybody's got their little section, and, and they're coming on the car with their backpacks, and and their backpacks are stuffed with coloring books, and and games, and and toys, and and they're bulging out, and uh, they get all situated in the car, and, and boy, we're heading off to a family vacation, gonna have a great time, and uh, we're no sooner. On the road, we, we just have barely left the driveway of the house. And uh, help me now, help me there at home. Uh, what's the first thing uh, that you hear from the back seat coming from the kids? Here, help me out now. You got it. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We haven't even left yet. And uh, we're just pulling out the street. Uh, down the street, we're not even arrived, not even close to being there. But immaturity wants to know, are we there yet? And how many Christians today, you're saying, are we there yet? Why hasn't God answered my prayer yet? Uh, why hasn't God uh, blessed me yet? Why hasn't God uh, done this yet in my life? Our immaturity shows because of our impatience as we go through life. Are we there yet? Brings back a lot of great memories. My wife still does that. Are we there yet? And, uh, and so there's a vast difference between childlike faith and childish faith faith. Uh, I want to have uh, that growing childlike faith that uh, Jesus uh, bragged upon when he says, consider those little children and to uh, have a childlike faith. But let's not be childish uh, in our faith and uh, impatient uh, in uh, our dealing. Generally speaking, we want things now, don't we? Uh, there's a psychological discomfort uh, associated with self-denial. People with an impulsive personality are more prone to be in a spontaneous mood and, and to show intolerance to any delay uh, of uh, any type of gratification. You see, individuals with an impulsive trait in their life are at greater risk to yielding to the appetites of the flesh and the lust of the flesh. Why? Uh, because uh, you, you can't wait. Uh, you, you don't have a pause. You don't realize there's a purpose in the pause, the shut-in time, the shelter time. And Elijah had to hide himself. He was sheltered in. Three and a half years. Three and a half years until he went back to Ahab and says, God's going to open up the heavens again. It's going to rain again. What's the purpose in the pause in our lives? Oh, you see, we need churches. We need Christians. There are mature Christians to be examples for others to follow. Uh, we need, uh, listen, uh, we need individuals uh, that are godly and Christ-honoring and uh, living for God. Maturity is, for the, is not for just a select few. It's for all of us as God's children. My prayer is that God would awaken us uh, to our apathy, give us a healthy disdain for immaturity in our own lives, the necessary discipline to pursue maturity with diligence and the hunger and thirst for a mature faith that waits for the reward, that trusts God for the reward, that doesn't become impatient with the reward that God says you have need of patience, that after you've done right, you've done the will of God, that you can what? Wait for that reward that God has for each and every one of us. Oh, what a great God that you serve. You see, you got to have patience if you're going to get answers to prayer. You gotta have patience. Hebrews 6 12 says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. If I'm gonna get answers to prayer, I gotta keep on praying. Not every prayer gets answered the first time you pray. Not every prayer uh, is heard or answered uh, the first time you pray. You got to keep praying in importunity and keep asking in importunity and keep pleading and continuing and steadfast. And then God in time rewards us after we continue praying. Uh, we have to be patient if we're going to see people saved. You got to be patient. If we're going to see people say, look in Luke 8, Luke 8, chapter 8, verse number 15. The Bible says, but that on the good ground 
are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, no sound, and bring forth fruit with what? Patience. Hey, if I'm going to see someone saved, it's not going to happen usually the first time. First time I witness to someone, they usually don't get saved. Uh, first time I, I interact with someone about the gospel, they usually don't get saved. And so if I'm going to see someone saved, if I'm going to have answered the prayer, then I've got to understand there's a purpose in the pause. We have to be patient if we're going to get along with each other. If we're going to get along with people, we've got to be patient. Uh, look in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4. I know I'm going quick. Uh, you might want to jot these down and we can look these over uh, back uh, a little bit later with your family, dads uh, and husbands. But Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 4. Hey, if, if we're going to see people saved, we've got to have patience. Uh, if we're going to if we're gonna, uh, get an answer to prayer, we're going to have to be patient. We've got to be patient. Uh, if we're going to get along with each other. We've got to be patient. Ephesians 4, verse 1, uh, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of vocation, wherewith you are wherewith called, with all lowliness and meekness, here it is now, with long suffering. that's patience, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The Apostle Paul repeatedly commanded Christians to demonstrate patience with each other. Uh, you see, we can do things and become very impatient with each other. And so it requires us to have patience. Hey, we have to have patience if we're to find healing from our grief. It's going to take time. We're going to, we're going to have to have patience to find healing from our hurts. Psalm 6, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 6, verses 2 and 3. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? He said, listen, I need healing. I need a, a healing from a wounded spirit. I need healing uh, from a broken heart. I need healing from a grief and a saddened heart. God, how long? God's the source of healing. But it takes time. It takes time uh, to heal a broken heart. It takes time to heal a wounded spirit. They're not immediate fixes. It takes time. What's the purpose of the waiting? What well, we see in Luke 26, 24, verse 49, Luke 24, 49, and behold, I send the promise, my Father, upon you that uh, they tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem and be endued with power on high. That word tarry is what? Wait. Wait. So much in the Bible talks about waiting. So what are we to do? Here it is. Here's the message. And in the next few moments, I want you to get your notebook, give you several points. What do you do in the pause? What's the purpose of the pause? Number one, stay seated. Stay seated. I've flown quite a bit over uh, the years, and uh, sometimes um, a plane will have to circle uh, it's landing for whatever reason, whether it's a landing gear, the weather, or uh, the, 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 the tower. Uh, they're just not giving them permission to land. And so they go into what's called a holding pattern, right? A holding pattern. And uh, the stewardess will come by and says, please, keep your seat, ba the seat belts buckled and please remain in your seat. Can you imagine the chaos uh, of a holding pattern when a, when a pilot is taking that plane and circling uh, the, the city or circling that runway waiting for the proper time when he gets permission to land. If everyone is up and, and, and just out and about and in, in a chaotic uh, position, in an uh, uh, environment, it would, be, it would be chaos. And so what's a stewardess go by? She says, I want you to stay seated. What do you do, preacher, when it's a pause, when there's a delay, when there's a sheltered in time, I want you to stay seated. Don't let, let listen to this, don't let the uncertainty of the moment cause you to act and behave in ways that is out of character to who you are. Don't allow the uncertainty of the moment to cause you to act in ways that is so out of, I've seen so many people act and behave and, and make choices that are so out of their character because they're in a very unstable, unsure, uncertain time in their life. And, and they're doing and behaving and, and acting in a way that is not who they are. But that urgency and the uncertainty is causing them to be, uh, not wanting to be seated. Uh, take your Bibles, go to Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, look with me down in verse uh, number 6. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 6. So, preacher, what do I do uh, during this waiting time? What am I supposed to do? Number one, you better stay seated. 
Now more than ever, it's not time to be bouncing up and running here and going thither and, and bumping back and forth. Listen, during the uncertain times, the unstable times, the unsure times, that's not the time to be making all these decisions and all these choices. Stay seated. Stay seated. Look at the verse here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And hath raised us up together, talking about salvation now, and made us what? Circle the word. Sit. Sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul said in Ephesians, we're seated with Christ. Where? In heavenly places. There's a, a calmness in those heavenly places. There's a, a peace that passes understanding in those heavenly places. There's a reassurance of God's presence with us in those heavenly places. We're from perspective of God's perspective, looking down at what God's trying to accomplish, not from this perspective, not knowing what lies ahead around the corner, but we're what? Sit. Seated. In heavenly places, that word, I want you to circle in your Bible, to sit together. There's a seat of rest in heaven, and it belongs to you. But if you're bouncing up and down uh, during the uncertain times, if you're uh, bouncing up and down, running here and there during the unstable times of your life, then you're not going to have peace. You're not going to have rest. You're not going to have calmness. You just have to sit down. Sit down in heavenly places, it says. Uh, you don't have to go through life agitate on the inside, worried about your finances, trying to make a family member do what's right, frustrated because a dream hasn't come to pass. Do yourself a favor. Hey, uh, leave, uh, let, go ahead and sit down. Take a seat. Enter into a rest that God has for you. And there's many of us today, we're anxious, we're nervous, we're stressed, we're fearful. Why? Because you're standing. You're not sit sitting. God says, sit down and rest. Trust God. Rely on God. Depend upon God. Take your seat, your assigned seat. When you live seated, you're in peace. You may have problems, but you know God's fighting your battles. People may have done you wrong, but you're not trying to be vindictive and get back at them. Uh, you, you don't give. Uh, you give it to God. You could go around upset and worried and anxious. Uh, instead, uh, you're going to stay seated. You know, God has uh, you in the palm of his hand. You know the number of days in your life are fulfilled. Just stay seated during these unsettled times. What's the purpose of the pause? It's to teach us and prepare us for a great purpose God has for us. But what we're to do during the pause? Just stay calm. Stay seated in your seat. Uh, Psalm 27, 3, though a host should camp up against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me in this, will I be confident? He was saying, David was saying, even though everything's come against me, I should be worried. I should be anxious. I should be upset. But there's no need to because the battle's not mine. The battle's Lord, the Lord's. God's in control. God's on his throne. So you know what I'm going to do, David? Say, I'm just going to sit down and just watch what God does in in my life, my home, my family, my country, my world. I'm going to watch what God does. I'm going to take my seat and just rest in the Lord, waiting patiently upon him. Oh, that's why God told the Israelites time again and again, uh, uh, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He said, I want you to stand still. I want you to be seated where you're at. He was saying, take your seat. I've got this. I'm bigger than your problems. I'm bigger than your heartaches. I'm bigger than your fears. I'm bigger than your trials. Just sit down. You're causing more tension and strife in your life by standing up. Just go ahead and take that seat. It doesn't mean we're not going to uh, not do anything, uh, that we just sit back passive uh, all day long. We should be responsible. We've got to pray. We've got to believe. We've got to dream. But do it uh, from a place of rest. Do it from a seat of rest. We've got to work hard with a rest on the inside, knowing that you're doing your best, and God is going to take care of all the difference. Work from a place of rest, knowing that God's favor is in your life. That's why the psalmist said, be still. Be be still and know that I am God. God says, you're so busy. You're running here and there. You're so anxious. You're always standing up, moving around. Just sit down and watch what I'm doing in your life. Watch what I'm doing in your home. Watch what I'm doing in your marriage. Quit trying to control every aspect of your life. Just sit down and rest in the Lord. I know it's easier 
uh, to preach it than live it. I got it. Uh, but it doesn't change the reality of the fact. It doesn't change what God tells us about this thing of resting and trusting and uh, uh, leaning upon God. Uh, God says in this passage, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10. Uh, Paul's uh, David's inferring that if you're not still, then you're not seated. And if you're not seated, then you don't really know God. Listen, if I'm going to learn about God, if I'm going to go to uh, the place of Zarephath in a better understanding of God, and a better recognition of God, and a better trust in God, that I've got to sit down during times. I want to take control and fix it. But there's sometimes God brings things to our lives that we can't fix. It's beyond our ability. We maybe can fix a lot of things. But eventually you've got to call the mechanic, which is beyond your ability. Eventually you've got to call a handyman to come in uh, when it's beyond you. Eventually you've got to call the plumber uh, when it's beyond your ability. Eventually you're going to have to call somebody in their things in each of our lives that we can maybe fix and we can sort of put a painting on it. But there's some things that only God can fix. And God says, sit down. I'll fix this for you if you just get out of the way and just watch me. Be still and know that I am God. Oh, I like this verse. Go to Psalm. Oh, I love this verse. Go to Psalm uh, 110. Psalm 110. You're doing good, paying attention. Great, great job, dads, keeping those kids in order there. Good, good job. All right, we're doing great this morning. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Uh, look at verse number one. This is great. This is great uh, with this thought. Psalm 110, verse number one. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. Circle that word, sit. Okay, sit thou at my right hand until what? I make thine enemies thy footstool. David said, God will make our enemies our what? Our footstool. Now, a footstool is what? Something you put your feet up on. You can't utilize a footstool if you're not sitting down. You can't enjoy the benefits of a footstool unless you're resting and you're seated. And God said, listen, sit down. And I'm going to take care of this problem. I'm going to take care of this fear. I'm going to take care of this anxiety so much so that the very thing you fear the most, that you want to tempt you to stand up and try to fix it and try to solve it, just sit down to the point that you can put up your feet and relax in the Lord. Even the very things that you are fearful of will become a footstool that you can rest your feet. Don't you love that verse? And so God uses the footstool to remind us to stay at rest. When you face challenges, things you don't understand, things that don't seem fair, one of the first things you need to do is put your feet up, relax, don't, don't become agitated, don't be, get that fighting mode, no, don't get in that retaliatory mode, don't get in that, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind mode. Sit back, sit down, put your feet up, and let God Take care of the situation. Come back to a place of peace, child of God. Uh, you must do this by faith because every voice is going to tell you why it's not going to work out. Every voice is going to tell you you've got to stand up and fight for yourself. You've got to stand up and fix the same. You've got to stand up and deal with the same. But the voices of hell, they're telling you to stand up. The devil knows that if you stay seated with your, your feet up on the footstool, you're no match against the devil when you're resting in the Lord. But when you're agitated, irritated, anxious, fearful, afraid, nervous, worried, that's where we're vulnerable prey to the adversary. You see, he knows when you're seated in peace, trusting God, he doesn't have a chance. It's easy to stand up. Anybody could do that. It's easy to get offended. Anybody could do that. It's easy to get live in worry and fear. Any of us can do that. It's easy to live discouraged. Anybody can be discouraged. Oh, but it takes someone that trusts God. It takes someone that loves God. It takes someone that spirits of maturity during the post time to rest in the Lord, to be seen in the Lord, and to use the very thing that the devil wants to cause you to stand up, to become your footstool. So you say, oh, no, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm going to sit back, relax. Enjoy this. That's why. Oh, let me give you this verse. I got, I got to give it to you. It's in my notes. I want you to look at it. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Get there. Get there quick. Come on. Come on. Hebrews chapter 4. Here it is. That's why Hebrews 4 says, listen, anyone can worry. Anyone can be afraid. Anyone can be offended. Anyone can get mad. Anyone can get angry. Anyone can be impatient. No character there. No dependence on God there. But look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Let us labor, therefore, get it now, look at this, that word labor. Let us labor, therefore, to do what? 
enter into his rest. Lest any, lest any man fall, uh, fail, fall after the same example of unbelief. God's saying we've got to what? We've got to labor to do what? Enter into that rest. It's going to take effort. It's going to take work. It's going to take diligence. It's going to take hard effort. God says the biggest labor you'll ever have is a labor to stay seated, to stay seated, to stay seated. That's the biggest work that it'll take. Anyone can stand up and tell their peace of mind. Anyone can stand up and be agitated. But it takes work, effort, determination, depending upon God to stay seated when you want to stand up and tell your side of the story. Uh -uh. Labor to enter in to that rest. Oh, good. Hey, so that's number one. You're doing all right? We're doing good. We'll get through these other ones a little quicker. Number two, what do you do during the pause? Stay seated. Number two, pray. Pray. Number two, pray. Luke 18, one says, it says, it spake a parable unto them. To this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. The key word there, the emphasis there that Jesus emphasized in the verse is ought Ought. It's not, listen, you ought to pray. There ought to never be a time in your life that you don't pray about something. It shouldn't be a last resort. It should be the first resort. It shouldn't be something you do occasionally. It should be something you do regularly. It shouldn't be something you do sporadically. It should be something you do all the time for all times in life. That's what God says. You ought to pray. So what do you do during the pause? Hey, that might be a good time to spend a little extra time doing what you ought to do. What you ought to have been doing when you didn't have a pause. Pray. Pray. Use that time uh, wisely. Uh, we should continue to pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5, 17. We should continue to be instant in prayer. Uh, as uh, Romans 12, 12 says, faint, don't get tired, don't get weary, don't lack energy. Uh, it implies giving up. Perhaps our faith in God, our hope in God is about exhaustion. But God says, uh, be persistent, uh, be consistent, uh, be determined, be focused, keep on praying. You ought to pray during the pause. So, number one, you've got to stay seated. Labor to stay seated. It takes, it's going to take a lot of hard work because so many of us have, are so used to popping up and just dealing with the problem, trying to fix a problem, control a situation. Sit down. You're causing more harm by standing up. Just sit down. Let God work. Let God do the job. You just stay seated. Number two, pray. Number three, trust the pilot. Trust the pilot. When you're in that holding pattern, you got to trust the pilot. Let me give you a story. The pastor was on a long flight home from a church conference that he had gone to. The first warning of approaching problem of this flight came when the, the lights flashed and says, fasten your seat belts. After a while, a calm voice over the intercom said, we shall not be serving beverages at this time. We're expecting a little turbulence. Please make sure your seat belts are fastened. The pastor looked around the aircraft, saw that many of the passengers would become very apprehensive, anxious, a little bit nervous. Later, the voice again came on the intercom and said, we're so sorry. We're unable to serve meals at this time. The turbulence is still ahead of us. And then the storm came. The cracks of the thunder could be heard even above the roar of the engines. Lightning lit about all about the darkened sky. Within moments, that great plane was bouncing and tossing around uh, like a, a, a cork on, on an, a, a celestial ocean just bouncing around. In one moment, it was lifted in terrific currents of, of air and then it would drop as though it was going to crash. As the pastor looked around, he could see that nearly all the passengers were alarmed and anxious and fearful except... One little girl. She sat calmly, feet tucked under her, looking at pictures, coloring in her coloring book, uh, obliv oblivious to the turbulence and, and problems that were around her. Sometimes she'd close her eyes and then go back to her book. The storm finally passed. When the plane landed and the passengers were disembarking, the pastor approached the little girl. He says, young lady, why? Why were you not afraid like the rest of the passengers? And that little girl replied, she says, because my daddy's a pilot, and he's taking me home. My daddy's a pilot, and he's taking me home. Oh, let's learn something from that little girl. Hey, you know who your pilot is? It's God. He's your pilot. 
Oh, you may look around and others are, are, are anxious and others are, are nervous and others are, are fearful and others are worried and you're looking around and if you're not careful, uh, you can begin looking at other people and people that used to be strong and stable now look very weak and frail and others that used to be a leadership role model now are becoming a toss to and fro and those that used to give you strength are now uh, discouraging you. And listen, you've got to know the pilot during some storms of life. You've got to know that who's at the helm uh, that's leading your life. It's God. And if you know God is a pilot, then everything, everything is going to be all right. Just as that little girl could rest in the storm because she knew who the pilot was. And then let me give you a last one. I'm done. Last one. I'm done. Number four. You better find someone to bless during the time of the pause. You better find someone to bless. I want you to take your Bibles, and we'll, we'll, this will be our last verse that we'll look at. I want you to go back to Job, if you would, please. Job, um, in, in our, right before uh, Job, Psalm, Proverbs. And go and get back there, if you would. Or look in Job where it is, and look where God tells us in Job 42. Job 42. Find someone to bless. I said, you said, preacher, what am I to do? I'm in this pause. I'm in this holding pattern of my life. Uh, you're just sort of in, in this limbo time in your life It seems like so unproductive and, and, and so uh, wasted of time. And what am I supposed to do? Uh, well, number one, you better stay seated. You better stay seated and not take things in your own hands because you always mess things up. Number two, you better pray. You better pray. And then number three, you better make sure uh, that you're trusting in the pilot. Hey, you got to trust in the pilot. Let me just say something about this. Uh, we better be careful when we're not putting our temptation to trust the government. You better make sure you're not trusting the government to bail you out of this mess. You better keep your eyes on the focus of God's the one that's going to bail you out of this mess. And he's got much more than a stimulus check that could come in the mail. He's got much more than an employment check that could come in the mail. Uh, you serve a God of all gods. You better trust uh, the God there. Then you better make sure that you find someone to bless. Look at this, Job 42, verse 10. Job 42, verse 10. We come to the end of Job's life. You know, he's lost everything. He's lost everything. He's lost his health and, and his wealth, and, and his, um, his wife has turned against him. All the children have died, and, and cattle have died. I mean, it's just, just a horrendous calamity have come into his life. We fast track through the story. We come to the last part of the story in, in Job 42, verse 10. Look what it says. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Oh, boy, don't you look forward to that? When God turns the, the problems, they're no longer a problem. The heartaches are no longer there. The burns are no longer there. The trials are no longer there. It's past. It came to pass. But notice, there was something that Job did to fast track the passing of this problem. I wonder if it's something that we can do as Christians to fast track the problems that we're going through, the pauses that we have in our life to be able to fast track. And look what it says. Uh, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. You can't get out of your problem yourself. It's only God's going to get you out. Uh, you can't do it on your own. But what's happened? The Lord turned the captivity of Job. Circle that word, when. See that word there, when? Circle it. So God turned the captivity of Job, the hardships, the trials, the, the uncertainty and, and the, the feelings of, of abandonment from God and walking alone and, and his friends turned on him and, and uh, had uh, belittled him and caused him as being the reason for the problem. What do you do? But The Bible says the Lord turned the travail, the problems, the hardships. When? When what? When Job prayed for his friends. Now, these weren't friends as we would think of friends. These were the friends that showed up and says, you're the reason you're going through this problem. These were the friends that turned their back on Job. These are the ones that falsely accused Job. These are the ones that were un unkind to Job. These are the ones that were unfair to Job. These were not friends as we're bosom buddies and, and yeah, I can pray for my friends. That's easy to know. These are the friends that were not friends. But, he's, but Job did not see those friends as enemies. He had to come through the course of his life, chapter now 42. And those that were his friends that had become his enemies, in his heart, they became his friends again. And he prayed for them. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Bible tells us that this was a critical juncture in Job's life. The turning point in Job's captivity that had ruined his life. What was it? 
God says, Job, I want you to get your eyes off yourself and get on, on others. You see, if we're not careful, we can allow this time of calamity to focus on me and my and uh, us and, and what's, woe is me and my life is so bad and it's so unfair. Hey, when he, when he prayed for his friends, and again, those weren't his intimate friends. Those were the ones that were against him. You see, if you want God's grace working to deliver us from your trial, you better exercise that same grace to others. But God, I'm having a hard time being seated. My grace is sufficient to keep you seated. But if you don't allow God's grace to be a part of your life, God says, I'm not going to give you the grace that you need if you're not willing to give grace to others and patience with others and kindness to others and goodness to others and pray for others. God says, I want you to share that grace. For Job to pray for his friends after all the evil words, all the unkindness, the injustices spoke against him. It says a lot about this man called Job. But God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for these rotten, miserable, cruel, self-righteous friends. That's when God turned the captivity. Oh, God, give us some mature Christians that rise to a place in their lives and says, God, I'm tired of the hardship. I'm tired of the burden. Well, God says it's in your hands when you pray for those you don't want to pray for, when you love those you don't want to love, when you're kind to those you don't want to be kind to, them, and only then will the travail pass. Oh, there's a lot of lessons that God would have us to learn in the time of the pause. Oh, may I encourage us today as we look at this time, this holding time. What's the purpose, preacher, of the pause? Oh, God wants to teach a patience. Patience for what? Not until I get what I want, but it's a patience of having done right to get the reward for doing right. You just keep doing right. You keep serving God. You keep being involved in the work of God. Don't get lazy. Don't get comfortable. Don't get convenient. Stay on fire for God. Stay passionate for God. Stay excited for the cause of Christ. And while you do right, God will reward you in time. But you just be patient. Don't be an immature Christian. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? When's God going to answer my prayer? When's God going to do this? No, sir. Grow up. Grow up. And let God be the foundation and sit down and watch God do some miracles in our lives. But you'll never see the miracles as long as you're running here and there and popping up and down your seat and giving your point of view and what your perspective is and what you think and your ideas, hey, sit down, sit down, and just put up your feet on the thing that Satan's using to motivate you and tempt you to stand up. And so I'm not going to stand up. I'm going to use that very thing as a footstool, trusting God that he'll take care of every need. I want us right now to bow our heads. God has spoken to our hearts during this season of pause. He's spoken to our hearts as a church family. I'm so honored to be your pastor. It's a privilege. I miss you. But where you're seated today, God can take this truth as he's knit our hearts together. And he can say, preacher, I needed that message. Oh, that's what I needed. During this pause in my life, during this pause in my life, it's something I needed. I want you right now to bow your head there. Use your couch. Use your chair. Use your sofa, whatever it might be. There in your car, just bow your head. Say, dear God, I'm so sorry. I'm always standing up. I just got to stay seated. Stay seated. You don't have to give your piece of, your, of opinion. You don't have to be so easily uh, offended and irritated and fight in fighting mode. Just seat, sit yourself down in the calmness of God. Let God give you strength. Let God give you courage during this time of discouragement. Oh, let God. Be the anchor of hope that you hold upon during these seasons of uncertainty. And tell God today, I'm so sorry, God. I'm going to labor. I'm going to work at entering into your rest. It's going to take a lot of work because it's out of character. It's so unnatural. 
So I've been so used to trying to manipulate and control every avenue and every details of my life that I'm now put in a position that's out of my control. Oh, but it's not out of his control. It's still in the hands of God's control. And what better plans to be in than his hands? Maybe you're listening to this broadcast today, and you not, know not Christ as your Savior. Oh, may I tell you, you don't want to go through this season of uncertainty, unsure of where you'll spend eternity. You don't know, you don't want to go through this time of, of, our, of our country where you don't know what might be on tomorrow. May I encourage you to trust Christ today as your Savior. The Bible says there's one way, and only one way to get to heaven. It's not through a Baptist church, a church membership. It's not through a lifestyle that we live. He's a good person. He's a bad person. It all comes in relationship with Christ. We have to realize, number one, that we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. No one's perfect, none, none, none righteous. That sin prevents us from going to heaven. Not only that, but that sin condemns us to hell. For the wages of sin is death. A wage is something you earn. It's something you deserve. That death is not just a physical death. It's a spiritual death. Separation from God forever in a real place called hell. That's what we deserve. We're sinners. Undeserving of heaven. Deserving of hell. But God loved us. And he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and pay that sin debt. So if we by faith would receive him and accept him as our Savior, we can know for sure we're going to heaven. We don't have to join a church. We don't have to go through some religious formality. But you do have to enter into a relationship with Christ to be saved, to have your sins forgiven, to not be afraid of going to hell when you die. If you'd like to know Christ as your Savior, I want you right now in the quietness of where you are, in your car, at your home, on your phone, wherever life has brought our lives together today, I want you to bow your head and pray this to God. Say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sins condemn me to hell, but I don't want to go to hell. Today, the best way I know how, I want to put my faith and trust on you, and you alone to save me, to take me to heaven when I die. Please forgive me of all my sins and save me right now. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, and thank you for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, would you do this? Would you comment and tell us that you made that decision? We have a packet we've pre-prepared. We'd love to send it to you. It gives you the basic building blocks of how to begin your Christian life. Uh, but we'd like to rejoice with you.